talking about the main upper limb fractures we see. I'll try, I'll try and cover most of the main ones in the handout. <coughs> um, this is this is the uh, list I'm going to go through. I'll spend some more time on on uh, some of them just because they're they're more common. And I think you should probably uh, know more about these if you're going to be working in ED and seeing these sort of sort of injuries. So and also like some sort of, sort of key points and a few things uh, not to miss as we as we go along. So this is probably one of the common, commonest fractures you'll see in it. It's one of the co common, commonly fractured bones, uh, clavicle fractures, very superficial, very easy to injure, um, and cycling, any, any fall from sort of uh, standing height, depending on how you land, will, will cause this injury. Now, uh, the vast majority, 80% of them are, are mid-shaft like these two, and so you need, and most of them can be treated in the sling, so, so which of them can we uh, do we think we might need to operate on them? Um, we'll, we'll look at that now. So the, 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 I can quote papers too, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, best, the best paper for clavicle fractures was from 2007 in Canada. And um, they looked at, at function after um, overlap uh, at clavicle fractures and treated non-operatively and operatively. And what they, what they found was the sweet spot is two and a half centimetres of overlap. Now, um, the difficulty is, because it's an S-shaped bone, and this is a two-dimensional image, how, how do you measure the overlap? So it was done on, on plain radiographs. So um, what they found is if it's shorter than 2.5 centimetres when it heals, you will get fatigue with overhead activity. So depending on your occupation or, or sporting or recreational um, activities, that may be an issue for you. And you've got to weigh that against having an operation which has got an infection rate, whereas not having an operation does not have an infection rate. So two and a half centimetres is the is the recommendation. And the other is the degree of uh, translation. So uh, does everyone know what I mean by translation? So percentage that's moved. So if you think if that's if that's the club like that, so the thickness of the bone is to one. So if it's moved at one thickness of the bone, that's 100%. Two thicknesses, that would be 200%. So they're saying 100% translation. So of these two, commonly thing, I would probably treat the top right non-operatively, and the bottom left I would speak to the patient about having an operation. And it, and you ask a lot of different orthopedic surgeons, you'll get different views, but that would be my view, because I think it's easier to get into unite primarily than it is secondarily. Um, so, and then this one, this there's more than 100% translation, there's probably more than two and a half centimetres of overlap, and it's commutated. So, this indicates it's a higher energy injury. So these, these sort of fractures, I would always uh, advocate operating on, so I think they've got a higher rate of, of, of non-union. And it's uh, got a stripping of soft tissue from that central fragment as well. Um, so, uh, it's just assessment now. Oh, here we go. <coughs> it's, uh, it's usually obvious on direct palpation. You can look and see, the, you can make the diagnosis by just looking at the, looking at the patient. The things to look for are any uh, open fractures or any potential open fractures. By that, if it's displaced significantly, the skin can really tend to over the spike. So that will be an indication to operate as well. Uh, it's coming up on there, but not on here. Did you have that issue as well? No? Oh, the, the right one's what's coming next. Um, no, but it's not on here. It's on, it's on there. Anyway, at the moment. Um, so you need to, I'll, I'll just look over here, but I'll try and project my voice that way. So, and neurovascular states of the hand. So if the, if especially if they go inferiorly, you've got a subclavian uh, artery and brachial plexus surprisingly close, and also the apex of the lung. So um, you should always do a check for those. Uh, and then you see an x-ray to assess where the fracture is. So the vast majority is at 80% are in the middle. Um, and then you've got the lateral third, which is about 15%, and then you've got the middle third, which is about 5%. Um, so examples of these here. So on the on the left, we've got a, a distal clavicle fracture, um, and they've got a high rate of non-union, so I would advocate fixing those. Um, and on the left, you can just about, can you see that? Going through there, so you've got a medial clavicle fracture, and it, I they're pretty rare, but I would advocate fixing those also, because uh, some pretty big vessels behind there, and so if, you, if they develop a non-union, the risk to the vascular structures is high with a 
uh, with a secondary surgery rather than primarily. So I've probably only had one of these medial ones in the last, well, since I've been in Melbourne, I think I've had in the last two and a half years, I've had one of those, which was a maroon, then we took it to Fox Hill, so we had vascular surgeons on site in case there was an issue. So they're pretty rare, but I, I, would, I would always fix those. Uh, so management, most, mostly in a, in a sling, and it doesn't really matter what sling you use, collar and cuff, whatever the patient is comfortable in. And I let them move pretty early, actually, probably sling for two weeks, and then below shoulder height, desk work, pretty much uh, after that. Um, distal third, they've got, as I said, they've got a high of some non-union, so I would uh, advocate fixing those. Um, and anything significantly displaced would need to be referred as well. Uh, and then all of this conservatively. So what's conservative management mean? Pain relief, ice, sling. I've written not collar and cuff there. This is part of this talk is for as a talk I give to GPs and I use their guidelines and they say not collar and cuff, but um, <laughs> whatever's comfortable for the patient. I don't think it affects the healing or management. Uh, and being holistic care and orthopedic surgeons, you've got to think about the patients, so they're elderly, home alone, are they are they gonna cope or do they need to be admitted but under the medics? <laughs> Um, so when do we follow up? This, this, is, well, this is what I do. I, I, two weeks, check the skin. Um, and uh, if it's a, a very displaced fracture, I'll, I'll probably get another x-ray and then start mobilising at that stage. And then six weeks, check the range of movement and another x-ray to ensure it's healing. And it might not be fully healed at that stage, but I'd normally get them going uh, at that point. There we go. So key points for clavicle. Any abnormal examination in terms of skin tenting or neurovascular issues, refer. Significantly displaced, 100% or 2.5 centimetres of shortening. Refer. Distal third, refer. Medial third, refer. But actually, you'll end up treating probably three quarters of them just in a, in a sling. So with, with clavicle fracture, I'll talk about AC joint dislocation. So this is the sort of thing we see here. This is the sort of interest of interest of mine. They've done, um, there's hundreds of operations for this and it was proved there's not one good operation. Um, and the issue is do they need to be operated on all? So uh, these are typically younger patients um, and have fallen the, on the point of their shoulder, um, of often motorbike or uh, sort of high speed on a, on a bicycle. Again, it's, if it's a big dislocation, it's a pretty obvious diagnosis just by looking at the patient. Um, prominence or palpable step and um, if you're unsure and it, it sort of looks okay and the x-ray is you're not sure what sort of grade it is then I, I, I find that the most useful. And I actually use that to uh, work out which ones I'm going to operate on. So if you feel the acromion and you bring their, their arm across, if the clavicle is overriding the acromion, for my mind that's an indication for operating regardless of, regardless of x-ray findings or anything else. Because I think that's proven to be an unstable uh, injury. Because obviously it's a dynamic thing and everything we look at with x-rays is static. But I'll go through, I've only put one, class, we love classification, but I've only put one in the whole talk, and it's, it's this one. Um, so this is coming on now, to determine the grade of the sprain um, or the injury. Um, so you need to get an x-ray. Now, a bit of mine, mind, if you, if you say query AC dislocation, the radiologists or radiographers will do weighted stress views. You don't, you don't need to do that. It doesn't age your diagnosis, doesn't age your management, it just causes pain for the patient. So I, I specifically, I actually put query clavicle fracture, so they'll just do a clavicle x ray <laughs> rather than do an AC. And then, and then I, if, if there's an issue, I'll write no stress views as well. The only problem is if you do a, if you do a full AC joint series, they'll get an x ray of the other side, which can be useful in the borderline cases. Um, so a uh, considered bilateral comparative for use. So this is the this is the one classification we've got here. So this is the Rockwood classification. Um, and divides it into six. So essentially one you've sprained the AC ligaments and it will look normal on X-ray. Um, so if they've had an injury, they might have anything to find, but if you do the cross chest they might be painful. Two, you you've got a sprain of the C C ligaments, the coracle ligaments, and um, they're not but it's not significantly displaced. Three, they're completely torn. Four, it's gone backwards, which again may be difficult to see on X-ray. And I think if you do the cross chest, they're in a lot of pain. 
So it goes backwards into trapezius muscle belly. So that's going to cause, they'll keep coming back if you try and treat that one non operatively if you think it's a one or a two. Um, five is pretty obvious, that's the one that really goes up, so greater than 100%. And that's normally buttonholed through the deltotrapezial fascia. So again, that's not going to heal very well with soft tissue into position. And six, uh, ignore. Uh, and so in sort of pictorial terms, this is what it looks like. So one at the top, it's just a, just a sprain of the AC ligaments. Two, partial rupture of the CC and sprain of the, of the AC. And then three is the one where you start to see this significant displacement really on x-ray. And you notice on the, on the bottom left, that's type four. You notice how it actually hasn't risen up, but actually that's a significant injury. Um, and then the five rises up quite a lot. And the six, I don't Have you ever seen, you, you can't even get an x-ray of the six. If you Google grade six Rockwood, it's, you can't even get one. It's so rare. It's, I, think it's a theory, I think it's a theoretical, when Rockwood described it, I think it was his theory, but I don't think it's ever been seen. I, I don't see how we could get under the coracle without fracturing, with all the soft tissues around anyway. But that's, that's the classification. Anyway, last class, first and last classification. So management, one or two, definitely non-operative. Um, movement as pain allows, pretty much. Ice, analgesia, sling just for comfort, but get it going. And they, they settle down pretty pretty quickly, in my in my experience. Um, again, try, if, they do, if they do play in sport and they want to play football, they're going to play football anyway, regardless of, <laughs> of, of what you say to them. And at, at the elite level, they'll just get injections to, to play and then carry on. Um, grade three. Now this is the controversial one. So this is the one that's gone up 100%. Um, because most, a lot of people will do well, and and there's a lot of professional rugby players with grade three sprains who don't have them operate uh, operated on. Um, but again, it's, it's with the club. Where a lot of it is with overhead activity. So if you've got a, a manual worker or overhead athlete, they may notice a difference, whereas an office worker probably wouldn't. So it depends on the on the activity level and the um, and the sort of work history of the, of the patient. The other, the other thing I sort of consider is if they're a manual worker and they're going to take six weeks off work, sort of letting it heal, and then they try and get back to work and they can't, they've then got another six to eight weeks after their surgery, so they've got a much more pro protracted period. So actually, for the Heavy money workers, I would actually push these more towards surgery than, than not. Um, and it's best done within the first six weeks, actually, because uh, then you don't need to augment it with any hamstring or biological graft because there's the, the propensity to heal. Uh, and uh, then, sure, discuss and grade one and two. Otherwise, grade the same as the grade one and two, just a sling and pain relief. Uh, and then, uh, so refer. So you guys <coughs> get them moving. Um, I, don't, I don't place any restrictions on them. Um, and referral for, yeah, key points. Uh, grade three or above, I say above grade three, refer grade three if it's overhead or manual, uh, heavy manual work, then I'll refer as well. So that's clavicles and AC joints. Any questions about those? Yes. Um, <laughs> with the distal clavicle fractures, yes. I thought one of the reasons to refer was because of the ligamentous disruption. But there is, I didn't want to get into that oh, too okay. much. Yeah, but the, um, it depends where the fracture exits the the clavicle effect compared to the attachment compared to the yeah. CC ligaments. Yeah, because okay. if it goes through them, then it's obviously unstable, and you'll find it's it's gone yeah. out. The distal ones, the very distal ones, which is like that example that I showed, yeah. is for uh, is for their non-union because the ligaments will still be intact in that in that example. Because it's got that kind of sliver. Um, so I get back to you. So, 
yeah, so the ligaments, yeah, so you might, well, I don't, this is kind of, this might have gone in between actually, because the ligaments kind of go like that. So that you may, one of the ligaments may be, may be intersecting, but the, the very distal ones is um, non-union, so that is the, is the reason we, or the reason I would, I would fix. I sometimes have LB patients who get them, they elect non-op, because the, the problem is such a small fragment, if you're trying to, if they get non-union that's symptomatic, trying to debride that and then bone graft and fix it is quite difficult, so it's better just to do it first up. Excuse me. Yeah. Your clavicle separation and displacement, is that valid for kids or is that an adult? Um, um, yeah, I haven't really mentioned kids, that's a good point. In, no, kids I would virtually never operate on. Is that really How old is a kid? Sorry? 16? Uh, no, 16, <coughs> 16, so, so uh, I think the youngest of proper operator is 14, clavicle fracture. Well, obviously if it's an open fracture then that's, that's different, but in terms of a mid-shaft clavicle fracture with because they've got there, because Sam's talking about propensity to remodel and the, the growth they've got got left. I um, But again, you'd use the same. If you had a like the the, the previous one, or was it this one? There's a general rule I'd say if they're, if they're getting towards the end of peak growth and starting to have more adolescent bone, you consider operating. But if they're very much a child, an immature child, then yeah, the nurse that's poking out through the skin. I'd, Virtually never operate on. Yeah, so if you had if you had something like that and they were 13, I'd probably leave it, Cause if it especially in a male because there's sort of three years of growth left. And well, they're, they're always be they always be left with a bump, but uh, non-union is not normally an issue in children because they're not smokers and they have medical problems. Um, so yeah, virtually always leave. The last phase is to close is the medial clavicle. And that's in your 20s. Yeah, so 23, 24. You've got like, longitudinal growth of your clavicles well past everything else, and your long bones closing down. Just you stop growing up, and then you get broader. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, if you see a medial, a, a, an SC dislocation in a adolescent or young adult, it's more than likely a physical separation. And so that's something that is not too difficult to treat, but will probably unite in time anyway. If you had like a mid shaft clavicle that broke in the same place twice, would you be more worried about the second time healing or would it not matter? It'll take longer but it'll still heal. Yeah. yeah. Or very rarely you might come across someone who's got a congenital pseudoarthrosis um, and you might see it as two fractures but it's actually never been fused. Mm -hmm. So it's back of your mind but pretty rare. That's my new shy. Is that Isn't more common on the left or the right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So moving on to moving down the arm bit, proximal humerus. So these are pretty common as well. Four to six percent of all fractures, and in the over 65s, they represent a third of non vertical fractures. So the one and two would be hip fractures and distal radius fractures. So will be there, and it's twice as common in uh, females because of osteoporosis. So this is the sort of thing we're, we're talking about. So here's a, a GT fracture and a surgical neck fracture. Again, a lot of them can be treated non-operatively, so it's trying to tease out which ones will need referral and which ones we can just put in a collar and cuff. Now, unlike clavicle fractures, these should be in collar and cuffs if you're going to treat them non-operatively, not, not slings, because you don't want any support under the elbow. And you, the, the wrist and hand has got to be above the elbow, so the arm's got to be bent. So you're just pulling down on the on the arm to try and just release the uh, tension muscles and just hold it all into sort of a reasonable alignment. So uh, when you see them, it's important to, to it can be associated with a dislocation, but the most important thing is to check the auxiliary <coughs> nerve. If you've seen these patients in ED, uh, so just test. I was routinely test sensation of the deltoid. Um, and you've got, you've got to feel both sides and say, does it feel the, feel the same? Not just, can you feel that? Because it could be a bit numb and yeah, they can still feel it. Uh, associated injuries are rare, but you should look for them, especially if you see maybe a younger patient who's got this injury because it suggests a higher energy injury. Older patient, it will be a fall from a, from a standing height. Um, x ray to determine, all my, that's gone blue for some reason. Uh, x ray to determine the, the type of fracture and the displacement. Um, uh, I 
And just a quick note about children, these, uh, again, in terms, of, in terms of what you accept in children, anything, pretty much, even if the, even if the, in younger patients, if the, um, I haven't got any x-rays actually, but if the, if the head is all completely off the shaft and they're young, less than 10, I'd probably accept that and just, it will, it will remodel with some thermal x-rays out there. So the, the main thing about children, though, to be aware of is to make sure it's non, it's not non-accidental injury. Because it's an unusual injury for a child to sustain, a bit like uh, the elbow dislocations and things. Uh, so, so there is another classification for this, which uh, which I'm not going to bore you with, but I'll just bring it into the into the fragments and trauma workout, which is which. So, the first thing if it is a is an isolated grade tuberosity fracture, and this applies whether it's isolated or part of a bigger fracture. So, if it's displaced within about five mi millimeters, you can. Can, um, uh, you can treat it non-operatively. Um, you think about the deforming forces. So when, when fractures deform and displace, it's because of the pull of the muscles on them. So if you think about what's attaching where, you can work out what the displacement is you're going to get. So great tuberosity, you've got infraspinatus and supraspinatus. So it tends to be pulled superiorly and posteriorly. And then less tuberosity, you've got um, subscapularis, so that tends to get pulled medially, and then the shaft, you've got pec, so that tends to get pulled medially. So these, so that, that's just here, but you can work out pretty much most places in the body. You know where the muscles attach, you can work out where the displacement is likely to be. Um, but if it's just an isolated GT fracture, minimum displaced, um, get in a sling and then get it moving. And uh, most, as you know, most joints don't like to be immobilized, and certainly, um, shoulders and elbows when we come to it, uh, particularly they don't have to be mobilised and they get very stiff and that's the, one of the biggest problems we see, it's not healing, it's not neurovascular problems, it's stiffness after the fracture is, is healed and that's it sometimes if we operate as well. Um, so these, if it's a great tuberosity fracture, apologies for the blue right but up, uh, I would x-ray weekly for the first two weeks and then again six weeks and if it hasn't displaced in the first two weeks it's unlikely to but it still can but you'd be a bit unlucky. Uh, and if it's greater than five millimeters old, it's very uh, Anything involved in the joint surface of the humeral head, I would refer. And the neck, surgical neck of humerus. So, displacement. So again, we've got one centimeter. It's um, a figure here. or angulated greater than 45 degrees. Uh, and that's the angulation between the position of the head and the shaft. So, like that, or off the back. So you need to look at all the views. Uh, and we've got a few x-rays coming out now. Um, again, it's, the management's the same. If it's not, if it's outside of those criteria, then you get it, uh, get it moving. So it's two here, just trying to illustrate it. So on the, on the left, you see the GT fracture. That's probably more than five millimeters of displacement, but depending on the patient, you may treat that. Not an obstacle value with me, or Sam, or any of you guys would need to fix it. Um, if you're 25 years old, you might just get x-rays for a couple of weeks and, and take that. But you, you talk it through with the patient. Uh, it also depends on the size of the fragment. That's quite a big bit of bone. So sometimes if it's, if it's a slither, then it's effectively like an acute rotator cuff tear because it's basically just pulled off. Uh, and on the right, you can see you've got the, you've, you've got the GT fracture, fragment as well, but you've also got a surgical neck fracture. So again, apparently I'd be much more likely to fix it on the right than the left, but potentially they both can be fixed. But you can see the um, angulation, so I don't know what, that's probably 30 degrees, this one. So if you take a, a line down here and a line through the head, it's probably uh, 30, maybe 40, not quite 45, so all along. But these are guidelines rather than absolutes, obviously. Um, so if extra articular minimally displaced, uh, most can treated with the supportive treatment, which is basically sling. Or collar and cuff. Uh, early mobilisation, I'll be talking I'll be saying that a lot during this talk, but yeah, early mobilisation is key. And again, very holistic, home help for the elderly, might not might have to be admitted under medics, and manage their osteoporosis. And these are more of significant injuries on the on the left seat, so the heads um, completely come off as in the axilla. Now I have one like this at Fox Hill I think uh, earlier this year. Um, so a concern about the axillary artery, so we've got an angiogram, and when we came in to do the surgery, the, uh, the vascular surgeon has 
dust heads up the subclavian, so they had control of the vessel in case I damaged the auxiliary artery when I was pulling the head out of their armpit. Um, so that was fine, the, the vessel was fine, but actually what we found was the auxiliary nerve was tensioned around the spike of bone, so she has auxiliary nerve issues afterwards. Uh, the one on the right, obviously, much more bizarre, benign, and again, it's another one you could probably treat non obviously although it is a bit embarrassed, so again, depending on the, on the patient. So, key points. Refer if the fracture involves the joint surface. Road tuberosity fracture displaced more than five millimetres. And a surgical neck fracture, greater than a centimetre or angulated 45 degrees, and mobilised early. So, questions about those? Probably said that probably relatively common, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. so. uh, yeah. I've got a way, they're either too good to fix or too bad to fix, that's my classification in the elderly. So either do a, <laughs> either, either do a replacement or I'll put it in a coronary cuff. As in the patient's too good or the fracture's too the fracture. bad? The fracture. Um, but obviously, so I'd either do a reverse shoulder or nothing. Coron cuff, oh. and it's only the younger ones that I'll fix. Okay, good question. Yeah. For some of the um, really small ones, yeah. Like, uh, how often do small. they do? Like, as in, or some of the really uh, simple fractures, I yes. guess. How often do they um, destroy the rotator cuff? Do you think that's something that gets missed a bit? Um. So, so you're doing like the GT like fracture? Like either alongside the incident or, yeah, um, depending on the range. Well, I think almost by definition their cuff's got to be intact at the time of injury to pull yeah. off the, the the GT fragment. Um, some of the, the old, because you, you don't often see these in patients with pre-existing arthritis. No. They have the, the, the stiff arthritic shoulder, they'd get a different fracture pattern. The shoulder mm. be stiff, so they get a humeral shaft fracture or, or something else. A bit like the hip fractures when you get um, uh, arthritic hip, you don't often get an intracapsular fracture, you often get an extracapsular. Oh, I've got that wrong way around. No, that's that's right. <coughs> so it's stiff, so the forces get transmitted differently as you, mm. as you fall. So most of them would have a degree of, can, uh, may not be very good, but there'll be some cuff cuff intact. And if I'm, if, if I'm fixing it, I do like a cuff repair, so I put some suture anchors in, suture through the cuff at the bone tendon junction, pull the GT fragment back down and then put a screw through the, okay. through the fragment to sort of reinforce the cuff and mm -hmm. fix the bone. And then you get it, and then the reason I do that is so you can then mobilise early. Yeah. Um, so. Moving down the arm, the elbow, proximal raise. It's a bit of repetition with sound, so I'll um, I'll go through that a bit uh, and we'll do that a bit more quickly. So essentially, proximal raise. What we really mean is radial head or or radial neck. So uh, this is more of an adult adult type fracture. So you can see the fra fracture line there. And what we're, what we're looking for here is associated injuries and um, the size of the fragment and displacement. So look for about. If there's less than two millimetres step, which is in the reserve, then that's fine. And you also look at the size of the fragment involved. So if it's less than a third of the radial head, you can probably live without it. Uh, and then this is the, the sort of paediatric version. You can see, what age are they, Sam, from that electron in your talk earlier? Oh, so that they haven't yet started peak growth, really yeah. started peak growth. Yeah. So they've got a lot of remodeling potential, but that's probably, <coughs> that's the, Articular surface here of the right head, which should be with the capital here, so it's probably 70 80 degrees to space. So, uh, and these heal very, very quickly. And as a patient at Northern, my, pretty much my first few weeks there, that got missed. I didn't get missed, got referred to fracture game, but it got delayed, turned up at fracture game three weeks looking something like that. Were you there? No. Uh, no. So she comes back to the bone school and things with a stiff elbow, but she has not. She's not done. She was about seven. She's not done very well. So the, these are ones not to miss. Um, so regular head more common in adults. Um, 
again, relatively, they, they've, got, they've got pain pretty much to under direct population of the road head. And they may have difficulty with rotation. They normally, quite, they normally bleed a bit, actually, so they're normally quite stiff with flexion and extension as well. Uh, neurovascular function, you know, for a minimally displaced fracture, is never normally an issue, but a significantly displaced fracture, you need to check for the posterior nerve. Um, and uncommon to get other injuries. Um, radial neck, so there's children, um, and again, pretty uncommon to get other injuries, but you need to think about uh, one edge of type fractures as well, which Sam's already mentioned. Um, so right head fractures again, so they get stiff, so you've got to mobilise them early. Um, so if it's less than two millimetres and, and less than a third of the articular surface involved, then uh, just in a sling, get them moving. Don't put them in a plaster and encourage them to get out of the sling as soon as possible. 10, 10 to 14 days max. Um, if it's more significant, you can put them in a backstab then, because then they're going to have surgery. That will just aid a, their pain relief. Um, if there's no rotation, it's just something's not quite right, then I'll get a CT, because sometimes there might be a fragment incarcerated in the joint which you can't see on the, on the x-ray. Um, and so check their movement in two weeks, and I, and I, I think early physio referral is, is important for these, because it's, it's a really benign fracture, but can lead to kind of pretty prof prof uh, profound stiffness and uh, morbidity for the patient if, if they're kind of immobilised and get and, and get stiff and you've got a very short window in which to get them going I think. Uh, the radial neck fracture is 20 degrees is the figure you need to remember here so that, that what we saw was about 70 degrees so as, as Sam mentioned the radial head's got to line up with uh, the capitella on, on all views obviously you can get more than one view but I'll just put that one in to illustrate. Um, otherwise back, so children don't get as stiff so I'm happy to put child in a back stuff for three to four weeks and then get it get them moving. Uh, adults and common injury. Uh, so here's your key points. Um, early mobilisation, there's your figures, 20 degrees ankylation. <coughs> and stiff again if this isn't stiffness then I think early orthopedic review is useful. Um, is that, de dealing with a stiff elbow, you wouldn't go in necessarily early, but dealing with a stiff elbow is quite a difficult problem if you can meet the patient and try and get some rapport with them early uh, and go through the process because some people are going, I can't get my arm straight, but they can actually bend it up here and it's what they're, exp I saw someone this morning actually fi fixed his radial head uh, and it's measured at the physio 12 degrees he's, and he goes, I can't get it straight. And I, and I tell them all they're not going to get it straight, he goes, can't get it straight. You can do everything else, no pain, it's healed, two screws, 12 degrees. So you, you've, got, you've got to have the patient on, on board and despite my best efforts, it sometimes doesn't, um, uh, doesn't work out like that. But I think an early conversation, especially if they're really stiff and you think you might have to do release or something later on, then I think it's good to, to, to build up some relationship with the patient. So, so radial neck fractures in an adult, I feel like I have seen a few. Yeah. Uh, pretty much. I'd probably watch them a bit more carefully. I'd probably get an x ray at um, uh, a week. Okay, so definitely. Yes. Yeah. 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 But otherwise, see them. Yeah. yeah. If it's undisclosed, yeah? Yeah. 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 Is, is something like a, like a radial head subluxation kind of a common outcome after a dislocation? After like a dislocation? That? Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. A fracture, and like not not from an isolated fracture. If if you if you're getting radial head subluxation, it suggests there was some, some ligamentous injury that was undiagnosed or or not realised at the at the time. Because the other time you see radial head fractures is yeah with complete, which I've not mentioned. Sure. It was with complete. Have you have you, Would you possibly get in there and like repair the annular ligament, or is it something that? Well, that may be one of the reasons with the we'll talk about that with the Montegio, Why you? Why you, if you fix the ulna, you can't reduce the radial head is because the the annular ligament is incarcerated in the joint. So most of the time, if you fix the ulna, the radial head reduces because you've got the anatomical alignment correct from the ulna. But if you can't, you have to open. It's virtually always the annular ligament's caused in the joint, but not not in a, in a radial fra radial head fracture. Then, yeah. No, that's not normally an issue. And is that why they have that limited extension sometimes? Because After, that. Because of that incarceration of the no no the the, the 
uh, the stiffness after our is, is, is you get the bleeding from the injury, it's, it's capsule tightness and stiffness, so it's basically the anterior capsule gets contracted. Sure. So it's a, it's a soft tissue thing, extra articular. So forearm speeding down the upper limb. Um, so Sam has mentioned it earlier, but basically this, this, this is an isolated ulnar fracture. But if you're if you've only got a, a single bone uh, fracture in the forearm, you've got to search for another injury, be it in the elbow or the wrist or uh, the other bone. So it's important. So I've put this into the straight. You've got to get both uh, the wrist and the elbow. X-ray, so you can <coughs> be sure exactly what's going on. So uh, generally, check the degree of deformity. If there's no clinical deformity, particularly in children, then you can uh, um, get away with a pass, probably depending on on the X-ray findings. Uh, adults, both bone forearm fractures, probably of the upper limb injuries, these are probably the most common to cause compartment syndrome. So always bear that in mind. You get a lot of bleeding and a lot of muscle contusion and damage from, from the bone ends. Um, as I mentioned, always examine the wrist and the elbow, and always the x-ray the wrist and the elbow as well. Can I just ask a question about that? I, the alignment, when, people, when radiographers do a um, forearm x-ray and they just do those two views, yeah. you don't get really nice views of the alignment. You don't, the in the acute and setting, you don't often get a, a, a good lateral or maybe a good AP, because yeah. you, you get you'll get maybe a lateral or an AP and then some yeah. sort of oblique because the patient's too yeah. painful. Um, so that's the initial x-ray and then I guess if it's bad you're going to do a reduction and then you're going to repeat x-ray and then because they've been a plaster they should be more comfortable so you can then check on the secondary x-ray. Um, you do so have to argue the point I think with the radiographers at times to say no I don't want a forearm x-ray I want a wrist x-ray because the, the beam will be get pointing in a different direction to what you're putting it at. It's not a yeah. parallel beam, it's divergent. So yeah. yeah, which is what, which is uh, another, another bit of mine is when, when it's a distal radius fracture and they x-ray the forearm. Yeah. Because the, the bit you're interested in is at the end of the film, and as Sam says, the x-rays diverge like that when you, so you're getting a lower quality image in the bit you're interested in. So it's got to be centered on which bit you're, you're interested in. Um, so, Children, children's forearm fractures, uh, these heal, heal very quickly, so if they're not in a good position, you need to uh, uh, get onto them quickly. Um, but basically, for the non-angulated coincidence fracture, above our cast, I get an x-ray a week, and then don't bother x-raying again, really. Uh, and depending on the age of the patient, between four and six weeks in a, in a cast. Uh, any deformity, then I would refer now to 10, 15 degrees.